distinguished guests. It's a great honor for me to be here today and to see that uh, this book was translated by you and comes out in Hindi language in a very reputed publishing house. I'm also glad to see so many uh, colleagues and former students uh, with who did a PhD with me or with whom I have worked together. It's uh, really a great day for me. Uh, and I have to say that it is um, very sad that uh, my co-author, Robert Fuda, is not here among us. I think he would probably have come if his health uh, had been better. Well, the original idea to write this book uh, was not by me, but was by Robert Fuda. He was always interesting from the very beginning of his academic career in, um, um, uh, in the legal order of uh, uh, also of traditional societies. I think that his first law and economics uh, paper which he wrote is a very interesting paper on property among the uh, original people living in Papua New Guinea. <coughs> and it shows how the property typically is different in such societies than in uh, modern societies. So he was always interested in it, but then resorted to uh, contract law and tort law and uh, these things. And myself, I had also a similar career. I had first worked as an assistant professor in the Institute um, of uh, um, Development Studies at the University of Bochum. And only later, when I became a professor in Hamburg, I moved to law and economics. But I, I gave never up my interest in uh, developing uh, countries and developing uh, problems of uh, development. Uh, and so we met one, uh, we met, Robert Kuta and I met in the, I think it was in the middle of the 90s, and Bob asked me whether we shouldn't write a book together, because he said, I'm interested in this topic, uh, law and development, since the beginning of my career, and you, are, you have been working on law, on, on, develop, on economic development. So that was the idea then, to relate new insights from um, the discipline of law and economics to problems of development. And um, it is now quite clear, and I think that, that has become common knowledge among uh, economists, uh, that um, the traditional theory by Solo and many others, but Solo was is the, the most important name here, that growth comes, economic growth comes from the mobilization of resources. That is the growth theory of the mobilization of resources and per capita growth comes from capital accumulation. That this theory is not wrong, that would be uh, not a good characterization but this theory of mobilization of resources uh, explains only less, roughly one third of economic growth. It does not explain two thirds. That was known from the very beginning of this theory when they then started to, uh, to try to find out how good the theory is and how it, uh, uh, how it uh, fits with the data and with, with the data sets. It was always clear that this theory explains only a small proportion of growth. And we economists, we call the rest, the 70% rest of it, technical progress, but did not know what it really was. 
and uh, the uh, legal, the economic legal science has shed light on this and has shown us how important economic um, institute, how important institutions in general and legal institutions in particular are. Uh, so, for instance, we know today quite well empirically, and there's a lots of literature on that, that a society in which investors are not protected by either the law or by substitute institutions, and where contracts are not enforced, those countries cannot reach a level, uh, a per capita income, comparable to those in those countries of, uh, let's say, Northern America, Western Europe, or Eastern Asia. It simply is not possible. And we know today that uh, we have to have especially legal norms which allow innovators and business people with a new idea to realize this idea and to get the finance for it. That is what we call the double trust dilemma that you, how can you bring together uh, a man or a person with a good idea and a person with the money. That is the double trust dilemma. So if the person with a good idea reveals this idea, then the financier can run away with the idea. And if he does not reveal it, then the, uh, uh, the businessman can run away with the money. That is a problem. How can we raise finance? So fi raising finance and laws related to finance are crucial. Then investors must be protected by the law or by a substitute institutions. If property, if the investment is not protected against the rest of the world, and the government itself, it will not happen. And contracts must be honored. This, how this is done, that differs from country to country. But without this, without laws which trigger finance, without investor protection, and without the uh, uh, servicing of contracts, economic development will not take place. Um, I, you know, in this audience, I cannot give you, uh, you know, a scholarly talk, but I want to give you a feeling, or one could also say a smell, of what laws good can achieve to the good, but also to the bad. <clears throat> now, in the Middle Ages, in the 12th and 13th century, the city of Venice, perhaps you have been there once or one or the other, the city of Venice was the richest city in the world, by, f by far the richest city in Europe and the richest city in, uh, in the world. And it was the New York of the Middle Ages. And uh, the question is, of our world, how, how did they achieve this? What, what, did they work so hard? Or had they, did, did the rich people exploit the poor people more? No. Venice had achieved an almost monopoly position in, tra in overseas trade, which in the Middle Ages was <coughs> <coughs> the trade between Venice and between Europe and Egypt, between Alexandria and Venice, and what we, what we call world trade that was went through this route. So all the goods from India, from China, 
from Malacca, from uh, Indonesia, and, and so on, from this region, East Asia, came by boat to Egypt, and then on camel, uh, camel by camels to Alexandria, <coughs> and from there to, you, to Venice and the rest of Europe. Now, what made he gave Venice this particular lead over all other Mediterranean cities which did not have these trade routes. <coughs> In the Middle Ages, overseas trade was extremely dangerous. That is, you know, the ships were not good. They were, you know, when a storm came up, you had to discharge everything. Uh, and lose the ship, perhaps. And piracy was also a big problem. And therefore, most merchants who had ships <coughs> used these ships only on rivers or along coastline, but not on overseas trade. Because if you lose a ship, then you lose everything. Now, the lawyers in Venice, there was a group of lawyers who tried to overcome this problem. And they invented a legal innovation, a new form, which was the prototype of the modern uh, joint stock corporation, which did not exist at the time. So they invented the joint prototype, which they called Compania Fraterna, uh, which enabled all the merchants in Venice to pool their ship in one company. And now they got shares, not of the, they did not own the ship anymore, but they owned the shares of the company. And if one ship uh, was lost on the way, then if you had 100 merchants there, everybody lost 1% of his uh, wealth and not 100% of the wealth. And this legal innovation enabled uh, uh, to do, enabled the merchants of Venice to do this overseas business. Otherwise, it would not have happened. And here you see that with only with one legal innovation, you had a big effect on the economy. Uh, I give you. Another, you know, related uh, legal innovation, perhaps one of the most, I would say, uh, far-reaching, and one can say most crazy innovation in law which has ever been made in the history of the law, is the invention of the legal person. You know all what the legal person is? And every lawyer learns it it's in the university, what a legal person is, what it's studied. But what a crazy idea is behind this, is this. A legal person is, does not exist in reality. It is just, you know, it exists in the thin air. But still, a legal person can make contracts, it can own property, it can go to court, it can uh, sue somebody else and can be taken to court. That is a legal person. So that is a, really, that did not exist until it started to come into existence also in the Middle Ages. And this enabled merchants, the legal person enabled merchants to organize their business, their business in a dramatically different way. And I will explain the effect of this just by an example from a country where they rejected the legal person. So the legal person, I'm not talking now of the stock listed company, which came much later, but the legal person, as it was invented in the 13th, 13th, 14th, century had first this effect, effect of pooling risk. You could pool the risk and do what the merchants in Venice had done. Many people owning uh, the person. Then the legal person provided for the merchants 
nor for the company as such, provided an asset shield against the creditor of the shareholders. Now, assume, for instance, you, um, uh, there is a creditor who gives a shareholder a credit, and the shareholder does not pay his private credits, then the creditor cannot say, you are the owner, co-owner of this company, what are your assets? We take away your assets. And if it is, for instance, the transportation fleet, then they take away the transportation fleet and the whole company is, goes bust. So whenever, in a, not in a legal person, but in a, let's say, um, well, in a partnership, that was the, 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 what, what, what we had everywhere, partnership uh, everywhere around the world, but the partners remain owners of the physical assets in the partnership. So if then one of the partners would not pay his debts to his creditor, the creditor say, went to the company, to the managers, and said, show me the assets of this partner. And he would seize the asset, and so every new partner would cause an existential risk for the company all the time. Also, when a partner died, then not the shares of the company, but the physical assets went to the heir, and the heir had to could decide whether he remained in the, in, the, in the company or not, or took his asset and went off. And therefore, any passing away of a partner posed an existential risk to the company. And the legal person, this crazy idea of a legal person, therefore, removed these existential risks and that was the precondition for that, that we had uh, now businesses, bigger businesses, which with many partners, whom you, otherwise you must have trusted each partner very much, that was not necessary anymore, and you do, did not expose your company uh, to an existential risk whenever you had a new partner, when you, you could not trust 100%. And therefore, that was the way into the bigger, into big business, and also you could establish a legal person for an indefinite period. So when somebody <coughs> died, then, you know, somebody would inherit, of course, but not the assets from the business, but the shares from the business, and again, there was not this existential risk. So, the consequence of this was that those countries which developed the legal person developed bigger business and long-lasting business and businesses and businesses in which the uh, uh, in which the risk, the general risk, like for the, in Venice, could be pooled. And now I'll give you an example of one of the most successful businessmen in the Ottoman Empire, who lived in around 1600 in uh, Cairo. His name was Abu Tayyip and uh, Timur Kuran, who is a professor of law and economics, but also legal uh, a scholar of legal history, and he's, uh, you know, he, he, he's. Uh, born Turkish, so he, he can read the Arab, the, the Turkish documents from the 17th century and so on. And he, in his uh, book, very good book, The Great Divide, where he analyzes why the Muslim world, which, had, which was more developed than uh, Western Europe in the year 1000, why Later on, after 1200, in the 13th century and so on, the Western world, Western Europe, gradually improved, whereas the Muslim world stagnated. And this is just an illustrative. He said the Muslims did not buy the idea of a legal person. They said, that is so crazy, we don't want this. It's too crazy. It was too a too crazy idea for them. 
And therefore, the only form to organize a business was for them the partnership. Now, I tell you the story of uh, Takia, Takia, a businessman from Cairo in the Ottoman Empire. He was the man who introduced coffee drinking and coffee houses in the Ottoman Empire around the year 1600. When he first started with it, the religious authorities were against it. They said it is, you know, something bad. But then he went to court, and the court, uh, he came up with 10 witnesses, and they all had to drink 10 cups of coffee. And then when they still could speak normal, the judges said, well, it cannot be so bad. So then he was allowed. And his great business idea was coffee was not, not, un, not totally unknown in the Arab world, but it was a very idiosyncratic drink. And this Abu Taik, he had the glorious idea to mix coffee with sugar. That was his business idea. And that made him rich beyond imagination. So he opened up coffee houses everywhere. He was the Starbucks of the 18th, 17th century and opened up uh, more than 2,300 coffee houses in the Arab world, in, including the, in Turkey, also in the Eastern Mediterranean. So he became incredibly rich. Then he died. So what? That was a partnership. So his wife got some uh, his children and so on. It had to be divided. This was a partnership. And the wife gets the coffee, the children get the sugar, and <laughs> the sons get the transportation fleet, and so on. You can imagine what that means. Ten years after his death, it was all gone with the wind. Whereas roughly at the same, no, not even before, the Medici family, you know, perhaps you have heard this Medici family, uh, they organized their business, it was a family business, but they had also some other partners in the business, in some shareholders, as a legal person. And that business lasted for 95 years. 95 years that in the Middle Ages that comes close to eternity. Now you see what the difference is. And you see with this legal form of the legal person, that was one reason why gradually in Europe the business became bigger and more, uh, you know, also more productive than the small businesses, the family businesses in the Ottoman Empire. That you cannot, as a, you cannot make a big business with a uh, with a partnership. Because you have always it's a tight, you know, the, only the best friends can do that partnership. So the, the, the most partnerships, according to Turan, were two partners, sometimes three, but four is already 9%. And the biggest partnership which ever existed in the Ottoman Empire was 50 partners. Um, so this is only one example. And I have little, I, if you, I overstress my time, I, I, you tell me, but otherwise, I give you a little, another more recent example on how uh, law uh, works to the good or to the bad. Uh, now, one very sad example, which uh, Egertsen, who is an institutional lawyer, an institutional economist in Iceland, in Reykjavik, but very well uh, known in, in this field, institutional comment. He wrote a book on uh, the Icelandic history of law and uh, economic history. And in that book, he has a chapter which is very telling about how one legal norm can lead a whole, even though small, society to starvation. 
No, that was in the 17th century, temperatures around the world, including Europe, went down. Now we have global warming, at the time we had global cooling. It was not, this global cooling in the 17th century was not catastrophic, it was not a catastrophe, but it had its impact in various parts of Europe because it led to a lower um, a productivity of the land. So they, that was the effect of it. And this effect, lower productivity of land, was especially, uh, you know, was more felt and was more, uh, uh, was, uh, was bigger than in the rest of Europe or in the rest of the world, in Iceland. So in the land, the productivity went down. Now, Egerton writes that for this, this should not have been a big problem for Iceland because if you, you know, imagine Iceland is an island and around Iceland you have the biggest fish, fishing, fish swarms in, the, you know, in, in that area. So if only, you know, if the, uh, if the labor force had left the, the worst soil and turned into fishery, they could have done this, they could have also sorted the fishes and exported them. Hamburg, for instance, my city where I live, was an importer of Icelandic fish. So they could have done this on a big scale and the standard of living would not have gone down, might have been increased. Iceland, however, even though it was a very small country of 250,000 people only at the time. Uh, Iceland, in Iceland, was Iceland was dominated by a small group of landowners. The landowners had the political powers, and they want and the political power uh, was based on the land and also on the productivity of the land. And therefore, they fear that if now large parts of the labor force would go for fishing, that would increase the wages. And if the wages increased, then the profit, the rent of the land would go down, and also the value of the land would also go down. So these landowners, these big landowners, were, did everything to prevent the people from going fishing. And then they passed a law in their parliament uh, which forced every person, every man, every, every man in Iceland to take up his homestead on a farm. Could not live near the coast, in other words. And that led to starvation in Iceland to such an extent that the uh, Danish government, which has a kind of imperial oversight, uh, even imagined of removing all the people from Iceland to, uh, to Denmark. They did not understand what was going on. So the last example, which might give you a smell, and also perhaps uh, a smell preparing for the food uh, you are waiting for, uh, is from Germany, from my country, and it shows how important it is that property rights, that is so-called in rem rights, or as the lawyers say, or rights which you can defend against everybody, against the rest of the world, so-called absolute rights, how, how important it is that such absolute rights change over time. Now, uh, after World War II, German cities were badly uh, bombed, also the business, the factories were bombed and so on, so there was a big uh, you know, need to rebuild all this, and for this we needed a lot of capital, of course. Now this capital can either be um, credits, or it can be equity capital. Germany is, however, a country which, unlike England or unlike the United States, but very much similar to Japan, has a, a weak capital market to attract equity capital. That for, 
I don't want to go into the why that is so, but that was a fact. It was not possible to finance this in most German companies with raising equity capital. So we needed more credits. But for the credits, you need uh, uh, you need for a credit uh, you need more uh, collateral and you have to pledge away. So the land was all pledged away. That was not difficult in Germany. But the movables, what about the movables? Can they also be pledged away? That is much more difficult. Much more difficult. In most countries, I checked this for this from uh, this book, which I wrote with Buddha. In Latin American countries, movables cannot be pledged away. It is impossible. So movables are more or less dead capital, as De Soto has once put it. So for instance, if you take Tennessee in the United States, with it, which is a country producing, you know, with ranchers, then if you have a contract, a credit contract, with, you are a rancher, you have a credit contract with a bank, and you write in the credit contract, I pledge all my cows on this particular piece of land, which are on the, the, the these are pledged away to the bank. That is a valid contract in Tennessee. But in Paraguay, as I have checked, that would be totally impossible. You would have to have a piece of land, okay, and then you would have to have the cattle on the land, but you must have a list with all the capital, with all the, uh, the, the particular pieces, all the cows with either their name or their brand, brand number or both, and have to um, update this list every week or every other day or so, I don't exactly know. Only then it is valid and only then it serves as a pledge. And that is so complicated that nobody does it. And the consequence of that is that all these cows are dead capital for attracting capital, for attracting credit. And in Germany we had exactly this problem too, not for agriculture but for industry. Now, lawyers, not, not the, not the uh, uh, parliament, but lawyers, law firms, together with companies, they said, what can we do? And then they invented a new form of property. They said, for instance, now take, for instance, the cement factory. The cement is produced with sand and with limestone, right? So the company buys the cement, gets a credit from the bank, and, uh, and pays the bill for the cent. And then the lawyer said, well, now the bank gets the cent as property. But it, it, but it can be used in the normal course of the business, but the bank becomes property owner. And the limestone is also property. You get the credit from another bank, you do the same thing. Now they make cement out of it. Then this contract or this new form of property says, now the bank A and bank 2, when it is cement, they become co-owners of the cement. And then they sell the cement, and then they get a claim, a credit claim, let's say. Then they become owners of the credit, and so on. And when the company goes bankrupt, then these owners, they do not get the ownership title of them. That is sold by the trustee in the, in the, in the proceedings, in the bankruptcy proceedings, <coughs> and now assume, for instance, that the, um, that the cement is sold off in the bankruptcy procedure, and that uh, uh, it, they get 200 for it, but they, the, the credit was only 100, then the rest goes not to the creditors, but goes to the junior uh, uh, creditors within the bankruptcy procedure. So and this was a totally new property creation, and everything depended now 
on whether the Supreme Court would accept this. The Supreme Court accepted this with some, it's more, a bit more complicated, but basically it accepted this. And this allowed German firms after World War II to mobilize everything which was movable to mobilize credits. And that, you know, that was one important reason why Germany could recover so quickly after World War II. Now, I gave you some examples which are partly in the book, partly not, but which give you a bit an insight on the spirit of this book. And uh, now uh, I think it is very clear that now uh, you should get a smell not of the book, but of something else. And thank you very much. Uh, Thank you.